Peter if he loved him. Peter affirmed three times his love the Lord. Christ asks us if we love him. We affirm our love the Lord in our worship. Christ calls us to demonstrate our love of in service. Lord, help us to witness your love in the ways in which we care for others. Singing the song of praise, I love you, Lord. Yes, okay. It's going with the birthday theme there. How else? My mom always asked us for one thing out of us brothers every Mother's Day, and that was that we called a truce and did not fight with each other. <laughs> there was also our desire on her birthday and Christmas and just about any time. <laughs> so, so that's how we celebrate Mother's Day. You need breakfast in bed, now that's leaving our style. Okay. Well, how, how do we, we, we tell our mothers that we love them, uh, and, and that's how we, that's how they, we let them know uh, how that we love them. We also give them gifts, we set aside a special day that we recognize them, but who else do we tell that we love um, in, in church when we gather on Sundays? <coughs> Jesus, good Sunday school answer. We tell Jesus that we love him in our worship, in our prayers, and, and how, else do we, how else do we express our love for Jesus? Pray. All right. Yes, we pray. Yeah, and we, and we, and we love Jesus by thank you. We love Jesus by by helping other people, by loving other people. Uh, we we tell Jesus that we love Him when we love our brothers and we love our sisters and our moms and our dads, our family, uh, but also the people that we've never met and how we treat them. And so, as we remember uh, our mother, moms this Mother's Day, and we tell them that we love them, uh, we also tell Jesus that we love Him by. Uh, the things that we do, the, how we follow him, 
how we pray to Him, and, and how we read our scriptures and sing songs. And so as we uh, remember this this morning, I invite you to pray with me this time. Lord God, thank you for these children. Thank you for the blessing uh, that they are to this church. Lord, I pray that you may bless them in their lives, and you may be with them as they grow strong and wise in you. Lord, I pray that we may remember to love you through our words and through our actions. All this we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>
Lord God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be good and pleasing to you this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask that our hearts, our minds, and our lives continue to be transformed and inspired by the good news of the empty tomb and Christ's resurrection. Lord, may we love and follow you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We recall how last week we looked at the engaging uh, post-resurrection story in Luke of Jesus walking with his disciples, those that were upon the road traveling to Emmaus. Last week we considered how in the midst of our lives, sometimes wrought with honest sorrow, with challenge, with disappointment, indeed walking our own roads to Emmaus in a sense, we recalled how Jesus joins us in the midst of such challenges and such times, and how Jesus approaches us and walks with us. We considered how Jesus gives us hope, how Jesus allows hope to burn in our hearts, and how God's Holy Spirit walks with us now here as a church in Silver Lake in our own faith journeys, and how the burning of our hearts, that hope that reaffirms the resurrection reality of Easter, allows us to recognize Jesus in our lives presently, thus making our hope very real and also perhaps very powerful. And while I can identify with the disciples walking to the road uh, towards Emmaus, as I mentioned last week, while I can identify with their frustrations, their sorrow, their expectation, it's with Peter, I must confess, as found in our gospel story this morning that I most often identify with. It is with Jesus' question posed to Peter, Do you love me? It causes me to pause and consider the authenticity of my prayers and my worship and my actions. And is Jesus' command, follow me, that dislodges me from the comfort of an old life or a familiar life or a life that keeps Jesus' call to discipleship just at that safe distance where it can't affect me too much. And instead, it draws me into a life of radical discipleship. Follow me an invitation to a life of radical discipleship, a life lived with abandon for the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ, a life defined by Christian love. And while the story in John might be familiar, we remember, we've, perhaps this is not the first time that we've heard it, that Jesus greets uh, the disciples from the shore, yet they do not recognize him, similarly to the, the resurrection story on the road to Emmaus. We see the beloved disciple calling out, recognizing Jesus, just as the beloved disciple recognized that Jesus was risen from the dead by the empty tomb in John's uh, story of the resurrection. We recall how Peter was naked fishing and threw a jacket on really quick and jumps in the water, swimming a uh, hundred yards. It probably would have been faster if they just rode in, but he was quite zealous. And we recall how the disciples haul in that huge catch of fish, a specific 153, and I'm not going to go into the numerology on that this morning, um, but it was significant enough to put down uh, on paper. But the, the point is there's this giant haul of fish, another miracle. And then Jesus prepares them breakfasts, cooked breakfasts of fish, and bread, which, you know, having, uh, going trout fishing in Colorado and catching fish and having uh, fresh biscuits in the morning, very appealing. That's not why this is my favorite story, although it definitely is alluring in that way. But no, Jesus prepares them breakfast, and in this scene that is very much, again, an homage to the Eucharist, to that final supper, Jesus breaks the bread, breaks the fish, blesses their time together, and has fellowship with them. And then Jesus pulls aside Peter and asks him three times, do you love me? And then after three affirmations, Jesus says, follow me. While this story is familiar, it is hard to understand the, Peter, uh, the story of Peter in this scene if we do not put it into context of Peter's life so far with Jesus. And to remember that, we go all the way back to the beginning of the gospel, and gospels, uh, to be sure. We remember that Peter was originally a fisherman, that that was his trade, his profession, and that Peter was called on the shores of the same Sea of Tiberias, which is the same as the Sea of Galilee, that, G that Peter was called by Jesus to be a disciple on the shores, similarly. 
That in early in Matthew 4.19, Jesus says to him, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. We remember that in Jesus' life with Jesus, Peter traveled, Peter's life with Jesus, that Peter traveled with Jesus for three years, no doubt witnessing countless miracles, assisting Jesus uh, throughout his travels, both through the basic necessities of going to get food, going to get the groceries, but also those moments, those thin moments when he was able to say, my Lord and my God, by seeing Jesus performing miracles. They learned from Jesus as a rabbi that Peter followed and collected his dust upon him in the tradition of following so closely with Jesus, following his teacher, teachings, learning. And though Peter is stubborn throughout most of the Gospels, especially Mark and his understanding, Peter continues to be a leader amongst the group. Jesus declares Peter, Kephas, the rock upon which he will build his church, Christ's church in Matthew 16, 18. Peter walks on water. We can't say that Jesus is the only one that's ever walked on water. Peter walks on water as well in Matthew 14. Peter was a leader, sometimes brash, but a leader of the disciples. And therefore, it would seem that Peter loved Christ. And I do believe that he did, with all the love a human can possess. When Jesus insists upon washing of Peter's feet at the Last Supper, as found in John, Peter, as zealous as always, says, don't just wash my feet then. Wash my head and my hands. Wash all of me in this case. And despite Peter's love expressed before Christ's passion, Peter fails as he is human. And we often fail. We often fall short of the mark set for us by God. For Peter, we remember, denies Christ three times. Even though Peter declared that he would not abandon Christ, Peter runs away, weeping bitterly after the betrayal of Jesus. And Peter is very absent throughout the Passion. Peter goes and hides in the upper room, afraid of the Jews. He locks himself with the door, within the doors. Yes, Peter runs and finds the empty tomb. But it is again the disciples hidden and locked within the upper room that Christ intercepts them and meets them in the first two resurrection appearances in John. And in John, while Peter can be inferred, uh, as I mentioned, witnessing the resurrected Christ twice and rejoicing, the bitterness and the shame and the defeat of Peter's denial of Christ, it seems, also manifests in his decision to go fishing in John 21. I'm going fishing, Peter declares. Now, in my mind's eye, in my imagination, and I think in line with the text, Peter is not just saying, I'm going fishing as you would on a nice Kansas sunny day like it's outside where I'm just going to sit and troll a line for a while. Peter's not going on vacation here. No, Peter is rather going back to his old job. Peter is standing at the shoreline of the Lake of Tiberias with a few disciples in tow and with a great sigh and no doubt with disappointment and perhaps the memories of the adventures that he had already had with Jesus. Peter says, I'm going fishing. I can't do this. I failed. He goes back to that which he thought he was good at. He was good at. He was a fisherman. Because the adventure was over and it was time to settle. After three years of following Jesus around and after the events which could not be fathomed with his death and this miracle of his resurrection, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And can we blame Peter though? For we often have a spiritual experience and yet we forget and abandon the impact of that experience. How could Peter forget the miracles of Christ, the teachings of Jesus? How often do we feel a call, a tug to ministry or service, and yet we deny it? Yet we go back and try to pick up our nets once again. How often do we start a Bible study or reading with zeal, and it eventually cools? Or that we leave worship feeling recharged and hopeful, but then, eventually, once again, even perhaps minutes after leaving the sanctuary, we fail, or we sin, or we forget, or we go astray. Perhaps we too, like Peter, find it simpler just to say, I'm going fishing. And we return to that, and we return to that which is comfortable, familiar. And yet, twisting in our hearts is this feeling that 
This isn't quite what we were called to do. This is second best. This is settling. However, despite this, like the road, upon the road to Emmaus, Jesus meets us in the midst of such times. Jesus meets us when we decide to go fishing in our lives. And with sorrow and disappointment in our eyes and our hearts, perhaps like Peter, Jesus meets us upon the shore. Jesus meets us after a night, a week, or a season of futile effort. For they fished all night and caught nothing. And if you've ever fished, that is incredibly frustrating. <laughs> Where there seems to be consolation simply in the act of casting the net. With each motion as you pull the net back in empty. And you remember each time that you walked with Jesus. That you received teaching from Jesus. That you loved Jesus. And yet, Peter remembers he denied him. Yet there's consolation, it seems, in the work. That we work to numb the pain of failure so often. For Peter, it was his failure to truly love Christ and his inability to follow Him in the hour of his need. And yet, once again, Jesus meets us in those times. Jesus meets His disciples upon the shore of the Lake of Tiberias. And as such, we witness a miracle catch, as I mentioned already. The details are not important for now. That's another, another sermon. Cast your net, right, net to the right. I'm sure that means something. Uh, catch 153 fish. That's just a lot of fish. In fact, what it really tells us is that Jesus is apt for abundance. That Jesus is a God of abundance. That like the wedding at Cana, back in John 2, that Jesus provides more than can even be uh, hauled in, than eaten or drank. And while, Jesus, while the miracle is important here, and while the miracle relie, uh, reveals Jesus' identity, the disciple that Jesus loves can say, it is the Lord, it is Peter, who upon seeing that, perhaps maybe just with a spark of, of, of an opportunity for a second chance, without thinking, because whoever really jumps off a boat, I mean, unless you're swimming, jumps into the lake and swims. With his heavy robes, he swims, and probably gasping, standing there looking at Peter. And then throughout the breakfast, we can imagine Peter's eyes, because has he yet talked to Christ after since his betrayal? We can imagine Peter's eyes not meeting Christ throughout the breakfast. I don't know if that was an awkward breakfast on the beach. I'm sure it was a religious experience. I don't know if they talked. But they shared breakfast together. And that was meaningful. But then Jesus takes Peter aside or speaks to him at least specifically, and asks him a simple question after that breakfast, no doubt with Peter's mind racing about what Jesus will say to him since uh, that last night um, before Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus, pulling him aside, says to him, asks him a question, Do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you, is Peter's response. Perhaps the first one was the politically correct response. Yes, I am supposed to say I love you to Jesus Christ. Okay. And then Jesus gives him a command. Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asks, do you love me? And again, Peter responds, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Peter means it. And Jesus gives then another command. Tend my sheep. And Jesus asks again, a third time. The threefold counter to Peter's denial is obvious here. Do you love me? And Peter, it says, hurt by Jesus' words, Jesus' persistent, Peter responds, Lord, this time with frustration, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus responds again with a command, feed my sheep. And then after a brief but cryptic parable about how Peter will die, which to have one's arms stretched out meant crucifixion. Jesus gets up and says to Peter, follow me. Justified Peter is called to follow not only Jesus as a man, uh, perhaps as Peter thought beforehand, before the crucifixion and resurrection. For Jesus had already called him to follow him by the sea earlier, we do know. But Peter is called to follow Jesus this time as the risen Christ. The shame and the disappointment of Peter's denial here, Peter's inability to love Christ fully and to follow, is now overcome. 
not by an act of Peter's will or by a mere second chance. For when Peter predicts, uh, for when Jesus predicts Peter's denial in John thirteen thirty six, Jesus is clear that Peter cannot follow until the events of the passion have passed. We read, where I am going, this is Jesus, you cannot follow me now. You cannot follow me, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, not understanding, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And that though Peter denies Jesus three times, his inability to follow Jesus resided not only in his own sinfulness, in that time that we tend to stray, but because he had not yet known the depth of Christ's love. He had not known even the definition of love that Christ spoke of, the love that enables us to follow Jesus, that love that is demonstrated upon the cross and the crucifixion. Peter thought he loved Christ before, and I'm sure he did, with that human love. But it is in the midst of this new reality, the reality of Christ's resurrection in the Easter season, that Peter's, and therefore ours as well, ability to love Christ is truly enabled. And what is the fruit of such love? What is the outcome of such love? It's not simply saying, I love you, Lord. Although that is part of it, as our children mentioned, saying I love you it has power and meaning. But the outcome of such love is action. It is a command following this threefold response to Christ. It is the command, follow me. Peter is not to return to his nets. He is not to return to his sorrow or his old life. Peter is to once again, but in a new way, previously unimaginable, follow the resurrected Christ. Therefore, to love Christ is to follow Christ. And our love demands action. Christ's interaction with Peter provides a blueprint for our own call to follow. Do you love me? Is the fundamental question repeated three times. And is the question posed to us this morning. And if we say yes to such love, there is a command for action. Peter's is to tend the lamb, Christ's lambs, Christ's sheep, Christ's flock. Peter is to tend, uh, to tend Christ's church. It's a metaphor for the church. To be an apostle, a teacher, a preacher, and a pastor. That is Peter's call story. But it, as it is a blueprint for Peter, it is also a blueprint for us. And they're asked, what is ours? What is our call story? Though we haven't walked this earth with Jesus as Peter did, obviously, we too, as Jesus' disciples, are called, in light of the resurrection, in this Easter reality that we proclaim and rejoice, we too are called to follow Jesus. What is that calling? And perhaps like Peter, you are called to tend to the church, to give a pastoral word to someone. I'm not the only one that can give pastoral words. To give words of comfort, encouragement. Perhaps it is to teach Sunday school or VBS in the summer. To feed the lambs and the sheep of Christ's congregation here at Silver Lake United Methodist Church. Perhaps it is by prayer or by leading in music. Or perhaps the outcome of your love for Jesus is different than those things. Perhaps Christ charges you with mission outside the walls of the church. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and giving shelter to the homeless through volunteer work. Perhaps bringing Christ into your profession through word and deed. Whether you might be a teacher or a coach, an administrator, a business person, a hard worker. We're getting very vague here, but it touches everybody. A member of a team. Regardless of your profession, let me be very clear. You never retire from your Christianity. We're always called to the church in such a way. The question remains, how are we called to follow? And while that question takes discerning on our part, it can take a lifetime to discern how we are to follow Jesus. Listening to the Holy Spirit and God's will as it continually tugs on our hearts and our minds, it rests on a more primary question than that. And that question that is asked of all of us is this, Do you love me? Do you love me, Jesus asks. This was Christ's question for Peter, and it is Jesus' question for us this morning. Do you love me? It is a question asked with grace, for we know well that we have often failed in our love. 
that we are imperfect, and that like Peter, we often stand at the shore with disappointment or at least dissatisfaction in our hearts. We stand there and long to just go back to what is familiar, to just go fishing. Do you love me? This is Christ's question to us this morning, and indeed always. Christ's reaching out to us in grace, giving us, even in the midst of our failures, denials and hesitant, or just forgetfulness, an opportunity to say, perhaps for the first time, or perhaps for the thousandth time, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And with our yes comes not an invitation, it's not optional at that point, with our yes, our acclamation of love, there comes the command, follow me. And we are called to live out our love for Christ. So this morning as we ponder Jesus' question, do you love me? How will you, how will we answer? Will we say yes to the love of Christ in full measure as Christ loved us in full unto death on the cross? Will we say yes to the love of Christ and leave our nets for good upon the shore of the sea? Will we turn towards Christ in our lives, forgiven and free, perhaps three times, perhaps a thousand times over, and not look back at our past failures and misgivings? Do you love me? If yes, then the command is clear, as it was for Peter. Follow me, Jesus says. Follow me in your discipleship, when you read, when you study, when you pray, and even when you sing this morning. Follow me in your work, your career, even your hobbies. Follow me in your relationships, your friendships, and even your conflicts and enemies. Follow me by loving others, as I have loved you, Christ says. Follow me, if need be, to death. Follow me not only because you love me, but because I love you. Follow me, Christ commands us. Therefore, this morning, let us turn over in our minds and our hearts Christ's question to Peter. Let us consider our answer to Christ's question, Do you love me? And with the courage, with the courage to answer that can only be sustained and inspired by love, let us say yes. And let us follow Jesus with abandon, with hearts and minds transformed by such love. Do you love me? Follow me. Amen. At this time, I invite you to sing with me our hymn following sermon. Lord, whose love through humble service. It's found in your hymnals number 580.
this time, I'd like to invite Tina forward for a mission moment from our youth group about the upcoming fundraiser they have to support uh, summer missions to New Mexico. Our year one of 144. Some of you may remember we brought this fundraiser up a couple years ago when our youth went to Florida. Um, in July, July 15th to 23rd, we have four adults and 16 kids going to Crown Point, Crown Point, New Mexico to work on the Navajo Reservation. So we decided we would bring back the RU1 of 144, and this is how it works. In the back, in the foyer, you're going to see a great big huge board that says RU1 of 144. What you simply do is you decide on which envelope you would like to choose and you are making a commitment to put that dollar amount in that envelope. There are 144 envelopes, numbered 1 through 144. You decide which one you want to make a commitment to. You simply put the money in the envelope and then you put it in the youth group office, or in the office in the youth group box with a yellow arrow, I do believe, or you can hand it to any church personnel. I have been on numerous mission trips with these kids, not only as a co-youth director, <coughs> I've been working with these kids for about 14 years on and off, and I'm also the parent, the mother of four kids who have been a part of these mission trips. They are not only life-changing for the youth, but they're also life-changing for the people that we are helping. But as you know, God's work does cost money. We spent about $2,000 just on vans to transport us that does not include gas or food. So any money would be greatly appreciated. The number one envelope is just as important as the 144 envelope. So if you would like, and you feel like um, you would like to help out the youth this summer, the board will be up for a few months. And like I said, any gift is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Tina. Thank you for uh, those words. And as one of the just, I think, over 20 people going on this mission trip, which I'm very excited for, um, and, and we have a new skill set amongst our youth, including drywalling and construction and stuff like that. So uh, this is an opportunity to give to youth in this, in this way. And uh, like I mentioned, even Peter went and had to buy groceries for all the disciples at one point. So this is an opportunity to sustain a ministry and to support uh, our youth who are going on this mission trip. So with that, I invite our ushers forward as we give now our tithes and our offerings.
son's holy name. While popular culture often diminishes self-sacrifice, we know that being a servant leader is a worthwhile calling. Help us focus on the Christian practice of hospitality by freely giving to others in your name. Accept this offering as a profound gesture of our desire to serve you today and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, as we prepare uh, for a time of prayer, for those at that time when we lift up together as a community, those prayer requests that weigh upon our hearts, I invite you uh, to share that those that might, you might want to share with this community at this time. Joe will go ahead and bring around the microphone. What prayer requests do you have? I'd like to ask for prayers for our former pastor, Kate Henderson. His uh, dad is doing pretty bad, and I think we're bringing in hospice soon. So we need very, very soon in our prayers. I'd like to wish to keep in our prayers to the family of Joanne Nish, who used to cook at the Boston Senior Center and their family at the parish service in Silver Lake.
Lord, that where there is doubt, there may, you may place faith. Lord, where there is fear, that you may place love. Lord, that you may make us complete with that deep shalom, that peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, we lift up those who are mourning or who prepare to lose someone they their love. Lord, we pray for your consolation, for the hope of the abundant life and the resurrection to come. Lord, this morning we lift up a special prayer on this Mother's Day. Lord, we lift up a prayer for thanksgiving for all the mothers that we remember and honor on this day in our lives. We pray for a blessing for the mothers as they are a blessing in our lives. And Lord, we also lift up uh, those who are not mothers, either by choice or not by choice. Lord, that you may give them peace and consolation, comfort, encouragement. Lord, that you may be with them. And that we may recognize on this Mother's Day, indeed, the strength and the leadership and the love of all women in our lives. <coughs> Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for those in our armed forces, those both home and abroad. We pray for your strength to be in them, your courage to be with them. Lord, we pray for all those who labor for the cause of humanity around the world. We pray for an easing of tensions amongst the nations. We pray a continual confession that Jesus is Lord. Lord, we also lift up in this hour of prayer our Methodist Church, our Bishop Ruben Signs, our conference, the Great Plains Conference, and our Council of Bishops. And we continue to pray for a way forward through the commission on the way forward, that we may be bound together as your church, as Christ's body, with love, with mission and ministry, our focus. Lord, in this moment of prayer, we ask that you now receive those prayers spoken in the silence of our hearts. <clears throat> and so, with the confidence of children of God, we pray all of these things to include the prayers of our hearts too deep for words, as we now lift up in one voice together the prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. stand for our closing hymn, Whom Shall I Send? Found in your hymnals number 582. Let us sing together.
Such good news motivates our love this morning and always. By such love, let us follow with all of our hearts the risen Christ. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.